me off a little off guard i was just into the song hey welcome if you're a guest this morning thanks for coming out and joining us joining us at twickenham we are really really glad you are here and a couple of things if you are looking for a church home we are always looking for new family members we'd love to talk with you about who we are and who jesus is and how we are trying not always successfully to be who he is We'd tell you our story and hear yours. We just would love to sit down and have that conversation. Just glad you're here. You can indicate an interest in having that conversation on one of the cards and the seat in front of you. You can also, and this is for everybody, you can put a prayer request on that, and we will be praying about those through the week. So you can put those in the collection plate when they pass by later on. Hey, we got Justin and John Rieger here with us this morning. Would you guys stand up just so folks who know who you are? They are here back with us from Ecuador. Give them a hand and welcome them. Glad to have them. They are the directors of the Hacienda of Hope down there. That's one of our um, main mission works down there. That's our thing, and we're really glad to have them. They spent some time in one of our classes this morning talking about that, and Justin will be leading us in a Lord's Supper meditation a little bit later on. But they're great folks. You ought to get to know them. One of the things we like to do is when somebody in our church does something well, we like to acknowledge that and celebrate them for that. And Alex Brown could stand up now. And besides having a wicked cool haircut, he just finished his Eagle Scout process. So this is an Eagle Scout right here. Give him a hand. So we now will expect you to be president of the United States one day in the future. So a lot of, a lot of that happens. That's, that's big stuff right there. So appreciate Alex. Uh, there is a wonderful passage in uh, the Psalms, Psalm 136. And it says something that's kind of our, there's something in there that touches on our thought for the day. We're, the thing that I'd really love for you to be looking for in our songs and in our scriptures this morning is the idea that there are some places you really can't go. You really don't need to go by yourself. You need a guide to get to those places. And Jesus is the one who can lead you and guide you into those places. In Psalm 136, there's a, a phrase that's repeated 26 times. His love endures forever. There are times when you're in a hard place, it's hard to remember that. Maybe that's why they repeat it so often. But in verse 16, one of the things it says is, he led them through the desert. His love endures forever. The desert sounds to me like a place I wouldn't want to go without God. And you may be in a place like that this morning. Can I just tell you that he is there with you? You may not feel it. You may not see it. You may not know it. He is there. We just sang step by step. And even in the darkest time, in the darkest moment, he will walk with you all the way through that. Let's stand. Let's continue our time of praise. We are so glad you're here. Let's lift our voices and praise the Lord. There is an endless song that goes in my I hear the Oh, my God. 
Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My Father's house has many rooms. And if it were not so, would I have told you that I am going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I am going. Lord, we don't know where you are going, so how can we possibly know the way? I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really know me, you will know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Lord, show us the Father and that will be enough for us. Don't you know me, Philip? Even after I've been among you for such a long time, Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. Be seated as we take our offering. Man of sorrows, Lamb of God, by Yeah. 
family is extremely important and significant to me as I'm here with family. I'm here with people that are passionate about family, that are passionate about love and sharing Christ. And as we celebrate this together, I can't help but think of family and think of community. In Ecuador, uh, a few months back, we had a, we had a major earthquake up on the coast. Uh, it even rattled us uh, at the Hacienda of Hope. Uh, we, were, we were extremely impacted uh, to see the rising death toll in Ecuador uh, as, it, as it topped out just under 700 people. Uh, for us, it was devastating. For us, it was, uh, it was death. And as always, that's, that catches us off guard. Uh, some of our kids were, were extremely uh, shaken up uh, uh, during the earthquake. Uh, they just uh, had trouble sleeping for a few nights, uh, but uh, we utilize this to show and share who we are and what we're about and what family means to us. So as people started preparing for crisis relief in the area, we became involved and we asked our kids to start thinking and planning for things that uh, they could do and that they could be generous with to show how their family with these people on the coast in Ecuador. Uh, Max, our, one of our eight-year-old boys, uh, he decided that he liked the idea of being able to share. So uh, he told his house parent, uh, Patricio, that he was gonna go and uh, grab a couple things uh, to add to the box that they were collecting uh, to, to send to the coast. Uh, he came back down with uh, two uh, tubes of toothpaste and one roll of toilet paper. Um, one of the boys saw him on the way down and said, hey, Max, is uh, that my toothpaste and Max said uh, yes it is as he dumped it in the box uh, one of the other boys caught wind of that conversation he said Max is that your toothpaste and Max said no it's yours and he threw that into the box um, then Patricio the house dad looked at him he said Max is that your toilet paper and Max said yes it is but what will you use, Max? Um, for us, we, it's important that we have family in this community. And for us, it's so important that we can share, that we know who we are and what it means to be part of family and what it means to be part of community at the Hacienda of Hope. And so for us, this is just a piece that we get to share with, with Max when disaster comes upon us. Uh, and we're family, and that's unfortunately what family means. It means through struggles, we're together. And so it's not all about the joys of being with family. A lot of times it's about the pain and the hurt and, and the things that we work through in community and with each other. And for us, that's what Christ does on a daily basis in our children at the Hacienda of Hope. And that's why for me it's a celebration to be in the same community and family sharing Christ on Sunday with you here in Twickenham today. Um, Jesus gave, uh, gave his disciples bread, and he broke it. He said, when you eat of this, when you partake, this is my body. That's the sacrifice I'm giving you. That's how much I love my family and my community. Pray with me, please. Dear God, we thank you so much for your sacrifice. We thank you for desiring and passionately pursuing us to be your family. Fill us with your spirit and bless this body. And bless this act as we partake of the body of Christ. In his name.
After that, he uh, took the wine and he said, this is my blood poured out for you, remembering me in it. That's, that's what family is to us. God, we lift up uh, this time, we lift up uh, the sacrifice of your son so that we may enter in and be family with you that we may give up of our struggles and be pure. That we know your love and can enter into your rest. In Jesus' name. Jesus, more like you, fill my heart with your desire to make me more like you. Jesus, more like you. Jesus, more. 
time that millennials, uh, people 18 to 30 or so, are kind of a spiritual, social, financial train wreck. You hear that all the time, right? right. So last week, we had a, a millennial up on stage. Uh, we had Dylan up here. And then uh, just a minute ago, I introduced you to an Eagle Scout millennial, and Alex, and this is Claire McKee, who's another millennial, and she's not a train wreck either, okay? Claire is the daughter of Christy and Tom McKee, and uh, she just got back from a mission trip that uh, we wanted her to tell us a little bit about, and you are going back to school tomorrow, right? Next Saturday. Next Saturday, okay. Are we on here, Dave? We got to turn it on? Turn it, turn it here. Lincoln? <laughs> I have to do everything around here. So. <laughs> so you're going back to school? Next Saturday. Next Saturday. And tell us where you're going and what you're going to be studying. I go to Samford University in Birmingham, and I study interior architecture and design. Okay. And you just got back from, uh, you went to India. Tell us a little bit about that trip. Yes. So um, the opportunity was given last spring for a few kids in our major to kind of act as a caboose to a senior thesis project in India, which was to design and build a hospital. And so the project and trip was to go back to India. And the first place we would go is called Delhi, which is basically like their Washington DC and New York City combined. It's probably their most progressive city and their capital. And that would be the first part of the trip. We'd be traveling around and sightseeing. And then the second part of the trip, we'd be going to their worst city, Calcutta. And 
there we would be helping two organizations. The first one is who they design the hospital for. They help with education and um, doctors, things like that. And then the other organization is called Free Set, which helps women come out of the trade, which if you don't know, Calcutta is home to the second largest red light district in the world, right below Amsterdam. But so these are people that were in, these women were in the sex trade. Right. Okay. And kind of how it works in India is it's a lot like the movie Taken, and so it's more of the scary side. Um, girls get pulled in around age 13, and they continue to be in it until a certain age when, this is kind of sad, but you know their beauty starts to fade. They're not as valued anymore, so they kind of get more freedom whether they're able to leave or not, and so. So when you hear about human trafficking, that's what this is. That's what this is, right? Right. Girls basically get told they're in poverty anyway, so they don't have much choice. But they're told, you know, there's a job for you um, in India, and in some of them are a lot of them are not even from India. They're from Bangladesh, other places. Um, but they're told, come to this city with me, and you can be a maid or you can be you know, work in a restaurant, whatever, and then they realize really quickly when they go with them that it's not a job that they want to be in, and they're trapped. And so, basically, when they get to the age where they're kind of, you know, not as valued anymore, they do kind of get a decision to stay in or out, and that's where Free Set comes in and friends them and gives them a job that's not um, so harsh, obviously. They sew and make things. And so that's where Free Set comes in and kind of rescues them. So. Okay. so how does somebody that's studying design wind up using that as a gift they've got to serve other people in the name of Christ? How, how do you get those two together? Right. Well, especially on this trip, I kind of struggled the first few days I was there because when I was really I got sick right off the bat, which was fun. But... Um, it was also 115 degrees, so we think this is bad. It's not. Alabama, it can get worse. <laughs> um, and so it was also monsoon season, so it would pour rain every morning and then be so hot during the day. And um, none of us could really keep the food down. We were getting sick. Just very discouraging. And um, I really struggled the first few days with why am I here. You know, I didn't design this hospital, and I... I didn't do any of this work. I'm just going to lay bricks. And honestly, you know, I kind of questioned God, is that really the reason why I'm here to lay bricks? You know, because I feel like there's a lot more people here that could do that. But um, You don't so, look like a bricklayer. Thank you. Know? you. Well, thanks. Yeah. Um, I did lay bricks. But um, anyways, I really struggled with why am I here? You know, how can I use my gifts here because I don't understand? And um, really quickly in Calcutta, we went to the hospital to tour it, and so everyone's ooing and aahing, you know, that had to help design it, and I just remember thinking in there, you know, why am I here, why am I here, and um, the lady, her name's Unok, she's actually Korean, she came and touched my arm, and if you can imagine her accent, she speaks Bengali, English, and Korean, <laughs> so it comes out very funny, but she says, um, you paint Oswalds, and I'm thinking, paint the walls, like with paint, you know, why? And she's, um, she says, no, you paint murals on all the walls you can. And I was like, what? You know, I don't understand. And part of me, though, was like, this is it. You know, this is why I'm here. And so she, I mean, how often do you get handed a paintbrush in a brand new hospital and someone says, do whatever you want, you know, paint the walls. That's so. never happened to me, ever. <laughs> <laughs> and so that was... An amazing opportunity I'll never get again. And so. And these are the murals here that you, some yes. of the murals that you did. Okay. And my friend Alyssa and I worked, we were just dropped off at the hospital after we agreed to it, which was kind of scary, but we're just alone in there, handed paintbrushes. Hang on a second. L look at that one right there. If you, can you imagine being dragged into the sex trade at 13 years old and then getting to see that and realize, wait a minute, there's more. Somebody loves me. Somebody chose me pretty powerful stuff. I'm sorry, go ahead. No, that's okay. And um, so anyways, we just started going to town, and it was fun. And once we started finishing, though, you know, the enemy kind of starts to speak whispers to you, I guess. And we struggled with, well, you know, like the light of the world. 
not up there yet, the light of the world when we were thinking most Indian people do speak English because they were under English rule for so long. So that's not a problem. But we were thinking, will they get that? You know, you know, that's a phrase that we know, but not them. We didn't really think about that. And then when we're sitting in the lobby, kind of looking back, we're seeing Indian people come in because at the time they had eye doctors there helping everyone. And I kid you not, this group of people comes in and looks up at the mural and starts singing the song called light of the world so they have a song they sing and it's just things like that that you're just like what you know we just did that spur of the moment we thought it'd be cool you know and now all these people understand and they think it's awesome and so the Lord just really worked already through those and so that was really neat one of the things that attracted Lisa and me to Twickenham was we knew that this was a mission-minded church and it would uh, the Hacienda of Hope and then we knew that you send your kids out to do stuff like this. That matters. That makes a difference to the people they go see. It makes a difference in their lives as well. Claire, we love you. Thank you for going, and thanks for sharing with us this morning. Let's give her a hand. So why don't you look with me in the Gospel of Luke chapter 5, okay? Luke chapter 5. That's where we're going to be this morning. Emory, uh, I've got a little bit of an adventure to tell you about, too. It's not quite as spiritual as Claire's or Dylan's were. But a few years ago, our family took a trip to, the, uh, to North Georgia, to the Chattooga River, to go whitewater rafting. We wanted to make a memory. You know how those stories usually end, right? So we chose the package that included Class 5 Rapids. Class 5 Rapids are defined as, well, here it is, extremely difficult, long, very violent rapids with highly congested routes, which should be scouted from shore. Rescue conditions are difficult, and there is a significant hazard to life. And I think we got our slides mixed up. That's about Atlanta traffic. Hang on, we got to... <laughs> So here's a picture of one of those runs that we were on, and that's our family. I believe this one was called the Jawbreaker. I think that's the name of that particular run. And as you can see, the boys have what I call a look of anticipatory pain on their faces. I think they're thinking, this is going to hurt. And that look on Lisa's face, it's kind of hard to see here. It's a lot brighter on my computer. I know that look really well. Uh, that's the, I'm going to kill my husband when this is overlooked. <laughs> that's what that is. And then I've got the, what was I thinking, look on my face. So you, when you look at that picture, you would think that for me, the most important people in the boat are, are, are those three right in front of me, the, one of the, the boys or or Lisa, but they really weren't the most important people in that boat. The most important to me, most important person to me in that boat, and, and really to all of us, was the young woman sitting behind us. You can see her left arm and her torso and just catch a glimpse of her ponytail just above my red helmet. She was our guide. She was a 21-year-old self-described river rat, and she did this every single day through the spring summer and fall that's what she did for a living she knew the river like she was married to it and here's what she said when we before we got into the water she, she said if you will do exactly what i tell you to do for as long as i tell you to do it and not a second longer we'll be fine and she even had us practice on dry land doing exactly what she told us to do for as long as she said to do it and not a second longer. We practiced that over and over again. They, then they had this orientation, which is where you sign all the legal documents absolving them of responsibility in case you or someone you love dies during the upcoming adventure. They had this, this orientation, and somebody in the, they, there was like 30 people that were there, somebody, some Georgia redneck, which I can say because I am one, he raised his hand and he said, does anybody ever go down without a guide? 
And uh, the guy that was leading the orientation, who never smiled, said there are two kinds of people that go down without a guide. Those who are themselves guides, and then people they pull out of the river if they can find their bodies. In other words, rafting a Class 5 river is one of those places you cannot go without a guide. And that's not the only place. There are lots of places like that. I mean, even if it becomes financially feasible, you will not be able to go into low Earth orbit without a guide, much less anywhere beyond Earth's gravitational pull. But you don't, even, you don't even have to go that high. Peaks like Everest and K2, you can't go there without a guide. And you can even come on down to sea level. The, the Australian outback, you can go there by yourself if you want to, but something's going to eat you. So even certain monuments and museums and, and exhibits require a guide. There are just some places that you, you cannot go without a guide. And we're, we're beginning a new series this morning called deeper and we're, and we're gonna we're gonna try to figure out what we have to do to go deeper in our relationship with God that that's what we're going to be exploring deeper faith deeper knowledge deeper commitment deeper everything and like a lot of the places that that we've been talking about this is a place you cannot go without a guide my goal this morning is just to introduce you to that guide and show you why he can be trusted. So that's, that's why I want us to look in, in Luke chapter 5. So here's what we're going to do. We will, we'll, we'll just read a few verses uh, in Luke chapter 5, and then we'll stop and we'll look around in those verses and see what we can learn. And then we'll go a little bit deeper and look around, and then a little deeper and a little deeper still. We'll do that four times, okay? There's kind of your roadmap. So let's start with the first three verses, Luke chapter 5. Should be on the screen, but if you've got your Bible, it'll be great to turn there. One day, as Jesus was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, the people were crowding around him and listening to the word of God. He saw at the water's edge two boats left there by the fishermen who were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little from shore. And then he sat down and taught the people from the boat. All right, let's look around in that a little bit. Good thing to notice when you read a passage like this, uh, they're called narratives. It's a, it's a passage that's basically telling you a story about some things that happened. A good thing to do is to notice the setting. Where does this take place? What does that tell you? Luke says this is taking place on the shore of Lake Gennesaret. We also know that as the Sea of Galilee. Um, by the way, in, in uh, 2017, March, uh, Twickenham's going to take a, a, a group to the Sea of Galilee. You'll actually get in a boat and go out on the sea and kind of experience what it was like to be there. If you're interested, you can go to our website, twickenham.org, and learn a little more about that. So the Sea of Galilee, or as Luke calls it, the Lake of Gennesaret, is not huge. 13 miles long, 8 miles wide, 33 miles around. Luke is the only biblical writer to call it a lake. Everybody else calls it the Sea of Galilee, and I have no idea why he does that. Um, I, I, I'm guessing here, okay? It could be that Luke was the only gospel writer to really sail on big water, the Mediterranean. And so to him, the Sea of Galilee looked kind of like a lake, but I don't, I don't know if that's true or not. E even if it wasn't an actual sea, the very mention of a body of water ought to perk our interest a little bit. Because in the Bible, there are about three places where God things usually happen, not exclusively, but three places where God things are almost always going to happen. Mountains, deserts, water. For example, at the very beginning, Genesis chapter 1, at creation, we read that the Spirit of God was hovering over the water. And then what ensues is God's magnificent creative power emerging from all of that. And then uh, Genesis chapter 6, there's no, the story about Noah's ark and the flood, that's a lot of water. In Exodus, the Israelites leave Egypt. They come to the Red Sea. They can't stop. By the power of God, Moses parts the sea, which is reminiscent of Jim Carrey 
in Bruce Almighty parting the tomato soup, which is one of my favorite scenes in all movies. But there's another instance of God doing something powerful around water. In the New Testament, Jesus walks on water. He stills a storm on water. He turns water into wine. So all through the Bible, then you got the whole baptism in the river thing. All through the Bible, almost every time there's water, something big is about to happen. So Luke, sets, Luke, Luke is setting us up a little bit for that. So Jesus is standing on the shore, but he's not alone. So we've kind of looked at where he is. Let's look at who's around him. People are crowding around him here on the beach. And we're not talking about the the kind of crowds that you saw this summer at Destin or Orange Beach or Seaside. This was a fishing village, a working village. These people weren't wearing Oakleys and Chacos. They're, they're, they're working folks. They smell like fish. They look like they've been working. And Luke says they've gathered around Jesus listening to the Word of God, which is another important bit of stage setting. Because Jesus is standing at the edge of the water and he is speaking the word of God. So you've got water, where God's stuff usually happens, and then you've got the word of God being spoken. So now you know something big is about to happen. Jesus sees two boats pulled up on shore, left there by the fishermen. These are not tracker bass boats with Mercury 175s. These are 30-foot long wooden boats powered by wind or muscle, working boats. And the fishermen are cleaning their nets, and Jesus climbs into one of the boats, one that belongs to a man named Simon. And he says, let me borrow your boat a minute, push out from shore. I, I want to use this as a pulpit. There's one more thing you need to know here as, as we, before we leave the first three verses. This is not the first time Jesus and Simon have met, and that's important. The first time they meet is in John chapter 1. Simon has a brother named Andrew. Andrew spends a day with Jesus. He realizes who Jesus is. He goes and gets his brother, Simon, and says, we have found the Messiah, come and meet him. So Andrew introduces Jesus and Simon. And then in Matthew, chapters, uh, Matthew chapter 4 and in Mark chapter 1, Matthew and Mark tell the story of what appears to be the second visit. Jesus is walking along by the Sea of Galilee, and he calls Simon and Andrew and uh, their partners, James and John, to come follow him. And they do, but they keep their day jobs. So they're, it's like they're going to night school with Jesus and working as fishermen the rest of the time. Okay, so I think what that means is that sometimes you have to have more than one encounter with Jesus before things change. All right, let's, let's go a little deeper. Uh, chapter 5, beginning in verse 4. And we'll read down to verse 7. When, when Jesus had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into deep water and let down the nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we worked hard all night, haven't caught anything, but because you say so, I will let down the nets. When they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break, so they signaled their partners in the other boat, to come and help them, and they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. You know what's irritating? When somebody who knows just enough to fill a thimble tries to tell somebody who possesses a truckload of knowledge in that subject matter how to do something. I hate that. That drives experts up a wall. This is like if I tried to tell Jim Van how to work with wood, or Rob Segrist how to drill teeth, or Karen Beal how to build rocket engines. They might be nice about it, probably, but I'd be immediately out of my depth. That's what's happening in these verses. Jesus is a great teacher. Jesus is a highly competent rabbi. He's actually respected, but he does not know the first thing about fishing because every Galilean fisherman knew that the time to fish is night and the place to fish is in the shallows but he wants Simon to launch out into the deep water in the middle of the day and besides the fish just aren't even biting Simon said so master we worked hard all, all, all night and haven't caught anything I, I really think I want to pause right there because that when I read that again this week that really sounded familiar to me master 
we've worked hard all, all night long and haven't caught anything. That sounded familiar. It sounded a lot like I already tried that and it didn't work. I think that's what, what I want to say to Jesus sometimes. I think that's what we want to say to Jesus sometimes. Love your neighbor as yourself. I tried that. Didn't work. My neighbor's still a jerk. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. I tried that. It didn't work. She's still the meanest woman on the planet. Wives, submit to your husbands. That ain't going to work. Children, obey your parents. That didn't work. Be reconciled to your brother. Be reconciled to your sister. Tried it, did not work. That's what Simon is saying here. Jesus, we, we did that. It didn't work. But now look at what he says next. But because you say so. You know, Simon knows he's not going to catch any fish. He's, no, he's known since he was a boy that you are not going to catch fish in the deep water in the middle of the day. No one ever catches any fish in the Sea of Galilee when the sun is high, and they never catch them far from the shallows. Jesus' command makes no sense whatsoever. But Simon does it anyway. Maybe, maybe it's fledgling faith. Maybe it's just respect for Jesus. I don't know what it is. But for whatever reason, Simon says, because you say so. Can I just tell you that that's not a bad reason for obedience? I mean, I know your parents told you to do stuff because they said so. Doesn't it hate that, right? And I know that you, you promised yourself that you would never say that to your kids, but you do. But this is different. This isn't Jesus standing over you saying, do this because I said so. This is you and me and Simon voluntarily, willingly submitting to the authority of Jesus and doing what he tells us to do simply because he's the one telling us to do it, even if it doesn't make any sense. Is there a thing going on in your life right now and you know good and well what God wants you to do? So it's not a big mystery, right? It's not hard to figure out what God wants you to do, but you're thinking, man, that doesn't make any sense at all. I don't see. Can I just be real honest with you here? A lot of times the stuff Jesus tells us to do doesn't make any sense until you do it. A lot of times the stuff Jesus wants you to do does not make any sense until you do it. He even said it was going to be that way. John chapter 8, verses 31 and 32. If you hold to my teaching, you really are my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Look at how that sentence is constructed. If you hold to my teaching, that's obeying. That's what that means. Holding to the teaching means obeying what he tells you to do, even if it doesn't make any sense. And after you obey, then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. I'm just telling you, there are a lot of things God wants you to do that don't make any sense at all until you do them. That's why they call it faith. So, Simon rows the boat out into the deep water, lets down the nets, and has to see a chiropractor the next day. Jesus apparently knows more about fishing than the professional fishermen, and we shouldn't be surprised by that. Because when this story opens, he is speaking the word of God. That's how the world was created, by the spoken word of God. God said, let there be light, and there was light. God said, let the waters above the heavens be separated from the waters below. And it was so. God said, let there be fish. And there were. What's harder? To speak a fish into existence or to catch one? So, yeah, Jesus knows more about fishing than the fishermen. He knows more about gymnastics than Simone Biles. 
He knows more about rocket science than the rocket scientists. He knows more about preaching than the preachers. He knows more about teaching than the teachers. He knows more about you and me than we know about ourselves. If it's true, there are some places you cannot go without a guide, and going deeper with God is one of those places, then you aren't going to find a more competent guide than Jesus. Let's go a little deeper. Verses 8 through 10. When Simon Peter saw this, the huge catch of fish. He fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord. I'm a sinful man. For he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. And so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. Two things here. First, you notice how Simon addressed Jesus? He called him Lord. Go away from me, Lord. Earlier in verse 5, he called him master. Master is typically used to refer to somebody who is in a position of authority. It can mean commander, it can mean leader, it can mean boss. Lord can mean the same thing. It can be a synonym for master. Or it can be used as an official title for a deity. I just think it's interesting that before the miracle, Peter called Jesus boss. After the miracle, he calls him Lord. The other thing that you got to look at here is Simon's response to this miracle. That's important. Go away from me, Lord. I am a sinful man. I think Simon is uncovering one of the reasons that we're reluctant to go deeper with God. I think some of us in the room are reluctant to go deeper with God. Here's why I think some of us think God doesn't want me to go deeper with him. God doesn't want someone like me. God doesn't want a deeper relationship with with somebody with my history. Only the really good people can go deeper with God. Deeper relationships with God, that's, uh, that's for the spiritual people, for the pious people. I'm not one of them. Besides, being a sinner in God's presence is dangerous, even with a guide. I think a lot of us deep down really believe that, that you can't have a deep, muscular, flourishing relationship with God until and unless you get your life all squared away. And then after you got everything fixed up, you can invite God in for a visit. I think that's one of the reasons we hide our sins and our sinfulness, and pretend we're not tempted. You know what I love about Simon? One of the many things I love about Simon, he just was not a hider. He just wasn't a hider. He just comes right out and says it. I'm a sinful man, okay? Just miracle just happened. Obviously, you're God. You need to, can't get away because I'm a I'm sinner. He's like an honest alcoholic, an honest addict who admits who he is. When he falls off the wagon, you know, you know what the first thing addicts do? Honest addicts, you know what the first thing they do when they fall off the wagon? They call somebody. Hey, I'm in a bar. Come pick me up. It's what I love about people in recovery. When they mess up, they don't run away and hide. They go to a meeting and confess. They know, Simon knew, that's the only way to find healing. Some of us right now, are hosting a vampire in our in our souls in our hearts something is sucking the blood out of our hearts out of our lives out of our souls sucking the spiritual life out of us the only place those vampires die is in the sunlight you got to drag them into the sunlight that's where they go to die can I just tell you you are you are among safe people in a safe place You do not have to be afraid here to drag those things out into the sunlight and let them die. That's what Simon did. Lord, I'm I'm a sinner. Like, Jesus is surprised? He already knew that. He knows, he he did the whole fish thing. (laughs) He knows Simon's a sinner. He knows you are too, and he's not surprised by it. He's not intimidated by it. He's not afraid of it. By the way, another thing you learn in recovery is that sobriety is one of those places you can't go without a guide. 
Okay, one more step deeper, verses 10 and 11. Then Jesus said to Simon, don't be afraid. From now on you will fish for people. So they pulled their boats up on shore, left everything and followed. Next week we're going to talk about why you don't have to be afraid to go deeper. The thing that catches my eye here is, is in verse 11. They pulled their boats up on shore, left everything, and followed him. That sounds like Cortez burning his boats to me. Simon and his friends made the decision to get out of the shallows and dive into the deep end with Jesus. Pulling their boats up on shore was their way of saying, we're going to do something totally different with our lives from this point on. Totally different. We're going a different direction. Here's the question I have for you. I want to leave this with you, and I want you to think about it. What would it look like for you to pull your boat up on shore? What does that mean for you? Maybe for you that means cutting the tangled lines of some stubborn habit. Maybe for you, it's, it's dealing with a past hang-up or a past or present hurt. What would it look like for you to surrender to Jesus as your guide to a deeper relationship with God? What would you need to give up? What would you need to change? You, you may need to think about that for a few days. And that's okay. Or you may not have to think about it at all. Like, like the people in this story, you've already had a couple of encounters with Jesus. You might be ready to pull your boat up on shore and follow right now. Or like Simon, you, you may need to meet him several more times before you're ready. Either way, either way. There are some places you cannot go without a guide. There are some things you cannot learn without a teacher. And there are some things you will never experience unless you get out of the shallows and into the deep. We're going to sing a song here and I, and I, I just want to give you an opportunity again this week if you want to come ratify a decision with us we'll we'll hear it we'll pray with you about it if you want to come for prayer just just to say i'm struggling with something and i really need your help if you're if you're ready to be literally physically immersed in baptism and give your life to christ we'll be late to lunch we don't care We'll be happy to do that with you today. If you want to learn more about it, we'll talk about it. We're going to stand. We're going to sing. If you need to come for prayer or any other reason, you do so. Who has the power to raise the dead? Who can save us from our sin? He is our Lord, our righteousness. Jesus, only
announcement series we begin. Clark, you can be coming on down for our closing prayer. Uh, a former Twickenham kids parent, uh, Christy Easterbrook, is organizing a collection of supplies for families down in Louisiana in response to this awful flooding that we've seen uh, depicted on the television. Victims of flood are in desperate need of cleaning supplies, push brooms, mops, bleach, drinks. Uh, many areas down there are under boil advisories. Canned foods, toilet paper, diapers, building supplies, school supplies. If you would like to help uh, in that effort, uh, you can bring donated items to Twickenham and uh, the fellowship hall downstairs. We've already got a table set up down there. We'll pack those up and we'll get those to the folks that are going to be taking them down. The supplies are set to leave uh, Tuesday the 23rd. That's this coming Tuesday. But we'll continue to collect supplies through the end of September. Our PAR team, Prepare and Respond team, is also going to be headed down there and we're going to be making a donation to help with that. If you would like to make a donation for that uh, relief effort, you can just make a check out to Twickenham Church and then in the subject line put Louisiana, LA, uh, Disaster Relief. You can give it to uh, one of the ministers or one of the shepherds or bring it by our office would be just fine. There is a Couples Reconnect seminar that's going to be led by the Family Dynamics Institute on Friday, August 26th, and Saturday morning, August 27th. Thanks to Madison Academy for arranging this. The leaders are uh, some folks named the Owens. I went to college uh, with them, and uh, this is a really, really good event, and it's so good, and we, we, we want to support you and your marriages so much that the elders have concluded that we will we will reimburse you the $30 fee. You go ahead and sign up, and pay for it, and then let us know. We'll, we will reimburse that to you. That's how much we, we want you to be able to go to it. Child care will be provided at this event. Uh, wedding shower next Sunday, uh, Jonathan Laird and his fiancee, Shelly Lawson. They're registered at Kohl's and at Amazon. So you can check that out in our bulletin. Uh, also, there's a note in the bulletin about you guys Thursday morning prayer, 6.30. It's not going to be at Angel Island, it's going to be at Hardy's? Where? Bojangles. Why Bojangles? Hardy's biscuits are so much better. All right. Anyway. Here we go. You know, Auburn, Alabama, Georgia, all that biscuits, Hardy's, who knows? Clark, come on up and lead us in a prayer and be sure and remember Justin and John as we get ready to send them back to Ecuador. Thank you guys for being here today. If there's anything our church can do for you, Please let us know. Glad you were here today. Let's pray. Dear God, we're, we're thankful for the message this morning. We're, we're thankful that Jody's challenged us to go deeper. We're also thankful for the example that uh, the Riegers set for us to abandon everything, burn their ships, and go to Ecuador to go deeper, to go deeper into the lives of the children there to go deeper in the lives of the people in the community. But their example has also inspired other people to go deeper and to be willing to go to Ecuador and to volunteer to work down there. We heard yesterday from them of some more people who are going to volunteer to work in Ecuador. And we thank you for their example and we thank you for their inspiration. We, we also ask that you would help us to realize that we don't have to go to Ecuador to go deeper, that we can go deeper by finding that person who needs us to spend an extra hour a month, to spend an extra hour a week, to spend an extra hour a day with them, to help them to be a better person, to help them come to know you better, to share with them the things that you have done for us, that you can do for them, to help us to realize that going deeper isn't something somebody has to do a long way from home, that something deeper is something that we can do by spending more time in your word and putting it into practice by reaching out to other people around us and being more involved in their lives and the things that they need. So we thank you for this challenging sermon and ask that you would help us to put it into practice in our lives. Through Jesus we pray. Amen.